Hello and welcome back. My name's Ash, this is The Outside Line. Now I've been playing through the original Formula One game, the PlayStation, and with each round of the championship, I've been telling a little associated story, if you like, relating to either the round itself or a driver or team that was taking part. Now so far I've done that as basically part of one big video, but I appreciate not everyone who wants to see some F1 history also wants to see some low resolution gameplay and, and vice versa. So for round four of the championship, I'm separating them. Round four of the championship in Spain is live now. You can go check that out if you want. But today we're talking about a little story that's kind of tenuously linked to that. So what happened at Spain 1995? Well, it was the first appearance that season by Martin Brundle. He was sharing his seat that season with Aguri Suzuki, uh, who was a pay driver, sorry Aguri, it's the truth. So Ligier got the funds from Aguri's appearance and then when Brundle drove he, you know, did well. And this got me thinking, you know, for most of my life, pretty much all of my life, Martin Brundle has been a commentator. I knew he was a racing driver because his final season in the sport was the first one I watched, but I didn't know much more about it than that. So I thought, let's find out. So this is the story of the racing career behind the commentator, Martin Brundle. It's no exaggeration to say Martin Brundle has been immersed in motorsports pretty much his entire life. He started age 12 simply racing for fun, taking part in grass track racing, driving a self-built Ford Anglia. After a few years of hot rod oval racing, in 1979 he started racing single seaters, joining Formula Ford. That year Brundle also wrote to Tom Walkinshaw asking if he could drive one of his cars in the BMW Championship at Snetterton. Incredibly, not only did Walkinshaw agree, Brundle lined up on the front row and finished second in the race. He would go on to win the BMW Championship next season in 1980. Brundle would also partner the late great Sir Sterling Moss in the 1981 British Saloon Car Championship. In 1982, Brundle moved up to Formula 3, taking five pole positions, two wins, and winning the prestigious Grovewood Award for the most promising Commonwealth driver. 1983 saw him move to Eddie Jordan's F3 team in a fight for the title against a little known Brazilian driver called Ayrton Senna. The title fight would go down to the final laps of the final race of the season at Thruxton, Senna eventually beating Brundle to the title by nine points. Naturally, both were promoted to Formula One for 1984. So that's a hell of a rise to F1, right? Surely a future title contender, right? Well, Martin Brundle's look was about to change. Brundle made his debut in F1 for Tyrrell, just like another legend we know, and finished fifth on his debut at Brazil, followed by a second place in Detroit. However, a crash during practice for the Dallas Grand Prix, yes, the Dallas Grand Prix, broke both his ankles and both feet, and the doctors at one point even considered amputating his left foot due to the damage to his left ankle. Brundle would recover, but he could no longer left foot break as a result. To add insult to literal injury, Tyrrell were later disqualified from the 1984 championship due to a technical infringement, meaning Brundle's results, including his first podium, would be wiped from the records. In 1985 and 86, Tyrrell's switch to turbocharged Renault engines meant Brundle would struggle for competitiveness and only score eight official points in his whole time at Tyrrell. For 87, Brundle would join Zack Speed, swapping seats with Jonathan Palmer, the daddy of being alert on a street circuit. Typically, just as this swap happened, Tyrrell found some form, with Palmer scoring six points that season. Brundle would only manage two for a fifth place at Imola. Notably, those two points would be the only points Zack Speed would ever score during their five-year run in Formula One. After a rough few years in F1, Brundle took a year out in 1988 to compete in the World Sports Car Championship for Jaguar and instantly reminded everyone of his pedigree, winning the title with a record points total and winning the Daytona 24 hours to boot. He also made a brief appearance in F1 that year, standing in for Nigel Mansell at the Belgian Grand Prix while he recovered from chickenpox. In 89, Brundle returned to F1 with Brabham, but it was unfortunately more of the same. A poor car saw him only score four points, have seven retirements, and fail to pre-qualify for two events. So, once again, in 1990, no F1 for Mr. Brundle. However, what he did instead was pretty damn good, 
as, continuing his relationship with Tom Walkinshaw Racing and Jaguar, he helped win the Le Mans 24 hour race. So, what did this mammoth achievement lead to? Why of course, in 1991, he went back to Brabham, who were now even worse than before. I'm starting to think you enjoy Misery Martin. But despite a terrible car, his fifth place at the Japanese Grand Prix, the last points Brabham would ever score in the sport, made people take notice. Which people? Benetton. In 1992, Brundle would partner Michael Schumacher and finally have a season to remember, and one that would actually stay in the history books. He would finally have a recognised podium finish, in fact he would take four third place finishes and come second at Monza, and he even came close to a win, hunting down Gerhard Berger for the lead in Canada before tragically his transmission failed. Overall, he finished sixth in the driver's standings. So, how was Brundle rewarded for his best ever season in the sport? He was dropped by Benetton, of course, in the place of Ricardo Patracy. No words. After nearly landing a drive at Williams, only to be beaten to the seat by Damon Hill, for 1993 Brundle had to settle for Ligier. While a notable step down, mainly because Ligier didn't have the then legal active suspension system, Brundle drove a fine season, grabbing third at Imola and finishing seventh overall in the Drivers' Championship. He would be the highest finishing driver without active suspension, while Ligier would be the highest finishing team without it. After another strong year, people took notice again, this time at McLaren. Although it was pretty close, as he was only confirmed as their driver two weeks before the start of the season. However, as I mentioned in a previous video, this is not as good as it first sounds, as the 1994 McLaren was running Peugeot engines and was generally total bobbins. In fact, it was the first time McLaren failed to win a race in a season since 1980. Brundle, as always, still drove well when the car wasn't dying on him, grabbing an impressive second at Monaco that year. Again, as mentioned in an earlier video, McLaren then signed Nigel Mansell for 1995, which went well, meaning Brundle would rejoin Ligier. However, he was forced to share his seat with Aguri Suzuki, because while Brundle was quick, Suzuki brought cash. In some of the races he sat out, Brundle would join Murray Walker in the commentary box. When he was in the car, he still managed some decent results, notably his final podium in the sport, with third at Spa. For his final season, Brundle would link up with an Eddie Jordan team again, albeit this time in F1. Despite a spectacular first lap crash in the first ever Grand Prix to be held at Albert Park, the first race I can remember watching, remember it like it was yesterday, he would go on to have another solid season, with five points finishes in total, but he was outperformed by teammate Rubens Barrichello. Brundle was offered a seat at Sauber for 1997, but in the end, decided against it. So, instead, that year, he fully began the career he's known for today, joining Murray Walker, then James Allen, Jonathan Lejard, David Coulthard, and David Croft in the commentary box, becoming one of the defining voices of F1. Brundle still raced in this time, returning to Le Mans on several occasions, most recently in 2012 when he drove an LMP2 car with his son Alex Brundle, finishing 15th overall out of 56. As a racing driver, Martin Brundle was incredibly talented, and maybe joining a different team at a different time could have seen him have a very different career, one that could be compared to that of his old F3 rival Evan Senna. But as a commentator, I think he will go down in F1 history alongside Murray Walker as a defining voice. And now his son Alex seems to be following him into commentating too, so it looks like we'll have a Brundle in the commentary box for many years to come. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this style of video when it's not being surrounded by, you know, low resolution gameplay, please let me know. Drop us a comment. If you enjoyed it, a like. And if you want to see more, maybe a cheeky subscribe. Uh, next time, in Justice for John Lacey, it'll be round five at Monaco. So the adjoining history video will be about a team that makes its final appearance at that race, Simtech. Thanks so much for watching, and hopefully I'll see you again soon.